Good morning, everyone. Got it. Let me make sure everybody can see that. Can you guys see the presentation now? Larry, it's I just loading. Want, I just want to point out, Larry, your volume might need to be turned up a little bit. You're a little hard to hear for my ears. Okay. And now we can see it. Okay, cool. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, this has been a good month so far. I hope you guys have been getting out to your favorite places in uh, Main Street districts and celebrating Preservation Month. Uh, you know, uh, Tracy and I really worked hard this year to put some things on that are um, uh, celebrating Main Streets is a, is a program that we're working on right now with some surveys in our official Main Street towns and really anyone can participate. And then we've been putting on these webinars. So. Today, it's the third installment of Preservation Month webinars, and I'm gonna share a little bit about design. Hey, Larry, can you just speak up just a little bit more? I can't really, I'll be yelling. Let me see if I can just do a little better. Um, so my name's Larry Lucas. I'm the Colorado Main Street Architect with the Main Street Program at DOLA. Um, I've been uh, working as a Main Street Architect, uh, both in Oklahoma and Colorado for about 12 years now. Um, Design is something that's a passion of mine, especially when we're working in historic districts. But this morning, I can't really just drill down on any one particular topic. So you guys are going to get a condensed version of design as far as the panacea that is Main Street design. So let's just start off with what Main Street design is. The Main Street four-point approach uh, has uh, uh, is, is combined to create a transformational strategy out of the four points economic vitality, design, promotion, and organization. Uh, design supports a community transformation by enhancing the physical and visual assets that set the commercial district apart. Currently, we have 91 main streets across uh, Colorado. 25 of those are officially uh, designated programs through an MOU with DOLA and the community, the town itself. Um, 66 are communities that have interest in main street. And we're just waiting for them to sign up and, and really make the dive there and commitment uh, to having a program in their town. So here's what we're gonna be covering this morning. Like I said, it's gonna be a condensed version. We're gonna move rather quickly uh, from each point to point. So one thing that I would like for you guys to do with me is just to stay engaged and actually survey each slide as we're going through that. There's gonna be some text on all the slides usually. I won't be able to cover all of it, um, this will be available later. Uh, I believe Tracy and I can get this to you um, in, a, in a PDF format or something like that. Um, and if you want the, the PowerPoint, just by any means ask, and we can get, if you want some images or whatever, glad to share. Um, so here, the six things that we're gonna cover this morning is, are the Main Street context uh, regarding design, historic preservation ethic, buildings, public and private reinvestment, community-led design, and the future of the past. So just starting off, the thing about Main Street and the context of Main Street is really the sense of place that um, is embodied by these places we call Main Street, um, which you know the definition by the National Main Street Center, a sense of place is a unique collection of qualities and characteristics, visual, cultural, natural, and social that provide meaning to a location. This is a slide we worked with a, 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 a Masters of Urban and Regional Planning student that developed this timeline for us about Colorado Main Street development. And we're gonna be studying it from about statehood all the way through the current era. Um, this is essentially just a timeline. Like I said, we could you can reference this later, but I wanna point out that each era, like frontier era, railroad era, industry, hard times, highway and preservation era, um, it had major influences that affected the development of Main Street at these times. You know, as soon as we have trains coming into towns, we have to be able to get more uh, things like some brick, maybe terracotta, harder to get windows and glass, things like that that weren't available originally when we settled the state. Um, so just as we as we walk through the, uh, as we see our Main Streets and we see the age of the buildings, we learn that there's just more and more technology typically involved whenever we're progressing through time. Um, doesn't mean that the older ways are not uh, staid ways of building. They actually are, and we're going to see that, 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 you know, the old ways are often the best ways. 
far as development patterns go, and what I mean is essentially, you know, we start out with just a couple buildings, maybe a post office and a general store and, and some houses that circle that. And essentially that's how main streets grow. Um, many times a community is platted right, right off the bat, like I know Lake City was because they wanted to get everybody in there as fast as possible and, and settle and, uh, you know, get their mining claim, get everything organized around mining claims and things like that. So uh, a, a grid was established. This is actually my hometown in Poto, Oklahoma. Um, this is a Sanborn map. And these are very rich documents. They were do done between, you know, one year and five years apart, depending on the location and the and the, the uh, how much is, was has grown over the period of time. They want to capture growth. Um, the red buildings represent brick buildings. So this was actually after Poto burned the first time and we started building back quote fireproof construction. Blue represents stone, and then the yellow is wood framing. So those are typically resi residences. Uh, one thing that I think is most important about Main Street is to examine it during its true heyday, before things really became suburbanized and we had automobiles that would take us out further and further to homes in other neighborhoods. These first ring uh, neighborhoods that encircled the Main Street district um, you know, are important historically, typically, uh, but also I just want you to call your attention to how things are developed. These are you know, deep block arrangements Typically, people needed uh, deeper buildings so they could store up things, uh, uh, you know, like stock and merchandise because the train only came so often. You know, it's not like Amazon nowadays. I mean, today we could actually deal with maybe splitting these buildings in half and having a business out of the back alley and a business out of the front because we can get things immediately. Um, but it wasn't that way back then. And also everybody wanted to have a, a frontage on Main Street. So that's why the buildings are typically 25 foot width lots. Um, sometimes they're double width lots, but generally 20 to 25 feet is that standard increment of development along a main street. And that's where you see each builder doing things differently. Or sometimes one builder, like in Steamboat Springs, uh, Halson, the guy that did, uh, had the ski hill there, he was a brick mason and he actually uh, did several buildings downtown and you can see his unique masonry style. So that's something also to pay attention to are, are details like that. Um, overall development though, we wanna think about what makes it, what gives it a sense of place? And it's things like the views in the Main Street District, gateways, like how do you get in there? How does it feel when you enter the district? Topography, you know, was it a railroad town? You can tell that very often uh, by the way that the streets are skewed from maybe another grid or things like that. Uh, you know, how highways interacted or didn't interact, how they skipped downtowns a lot of times and actually took business away from Main Street during that highway era where things started to lead into a period of disinvestment and people, and that's why we have Main Streets because at one point all Main Streets were really suffering. And then of course we have the legal boundaries and streets, but I encourage you to find the Sanborn maps for your community. This link that'll be available in the PDF will lead you to um, the uh, uh, Library of Congress where there are a lot, but also Denver Public Library has quite a few. What are the assets that we have? And our, you know, what are the assets of the districts? Well. You know, there was an era of construction that we have to consider uh, that first timeline. What historic landmarks are there there? What are the important buildings? What are the important spaces? What are the styles represented? You know, um, the scale of buildings, oh, you know, uh, the streetscape, how does, how does that work? You know, a lot of times streetscapes and street widths were designed, and this is just something I've heard, um, they're often wider in some towns so that a horse and buggy could turn around in the middle of the street. You know, I think that's an interesting, uh, interesting uh, idea. I'm not sure that's 100% fact, but it makes sense. Also, the types of materials, the colors of facades, you know, natural brick has different colors, wood, siding, you know, those can be painted, but, you know, your typical earthen materials um, represent a certain thing. And how, how good a shape are things in? You know, some towns have been highly occupied ever since uh, origination, and they have like full occupancy. In other towns, you know, things really shifted after the gold boom or things like that. And we have more good buildings than businesses sometimes, which is a problem that we're trying to solve in, in many of our communities. One thing I wanna point out is if you have a building on Main Street or even a house, and you think that it needs to be designated, one thing you can do is go to History of Colorado and complete this preliminary property evaluation form. Um, I believe if you, if you click on the image in the presentation, it will take you to this online. Um, you will fill this out and you will work with the state register historians and you'll be able to find out if your building could qualify. And if so, 
then you would complete an application or uh, a nomination form for your property. Kind of on a bigger scale, we have something called the Downtown Historic Survey. This is one that was just done in La Junta. These are fascinating documents. They talk about the development of downtown. They talk about the influences of downtown and the things we've been talking about. They also drill down you know, in detail for every building and talk about you know, in an intensive way, often, uh, you know, what, who owned the building even, you know, when it was built, you know, things that have happened, major businesses, uh, major events, um, great resource. If you have these available in your town, which you could call and, and um, find this out at History Colorado, I think uh, Lindsay Fluelli with the director of the CLG program could get you in, in uh, connected with these kinds of documents for your town if they have been done. They're not done enough, in my opinion. Um, there are free CLG grants if you're a certified local government um, that you can actually access to complete this work with a match. Uh, actually, excuse me, there's no match from uh, for CLG grants, um, but you know there may be a little additional money beyond what CLG can provide that could be matched by the town to do these. Well, let's just talk about historic preservation now itself. So historic preservation is the act of identifying, protecting, and enhancing buildings, places, and objects of historical and cultural significance. But why do we preserve? And I love this quote, without old structures, cities take on a different character. Neighborhoods lose their identity. We more easily forget who went before us. Each time an old building is torn down, one of our cultural roots is let's go. Um, that's really the fact, you know, we have missing buildings, fires change things, um, you know, we're always in shift, things are always changing, but, but what is important to keep as it was, what things need to be adaptively reused, you know, for new uses, which things need to be modified in order to meet modern standards, those are all big questions in preservation, and those are, those are some of the hardest conversations sometimes is how to correctly restore a property or rehabilitate a property to the correct time period. One thing I think also is interesting is these buildings are doggone important. Um, you know, uh, and today, 80% um, of the buildings that are here, we will still be using them. Um, that's accounting for, you know, two to 3% new buildings every year type of a figure in the United States. Um, so keep in mind that we're only borrowing these buildings. Like that's the best thing about Main Street buildings is that they've been passed down from generation to generation already, like for many different owners. And the stewardship of these places is super important and being able to, you know, leave things a little bit better than you found them is something that was impressed on me and Boy Scouts. And I think uh, that's something we ought to think about too with our Main Street building. Again, why do we preserve? You know, uh, we retain history and authenticity. We increase commercial value, which there have been studies that show that uh, towns that practice good quality historic preservation, the property values, especially around the district and in the neighborhoods around the district, um, is their the properties are worth more typically. Um, we're retaining materials and uh, and workmanship that's already gone into the building. You know, even that guy's peanut butter and jelly sandwich that his wife made for him and he went and laid bricks that day. I count that as energy that goes into the building, physical energy. And I think that's something that's it's tough to lose those kinds of things, especially when your forefathers in your small towns or big cities uh, were the ones building these buildings. I think also you have immediate usable space. These are very simple buildings. They're a rectangular space inside. You can do so much with them typically. And that's one thing that's attractive, especially for new businesses. Um, the, the ability to have diversity of businesses very quickly um, and also in, in change occupancies, change uses. Um, is, is the fantastic quality of these buildings. Um, uh, rehabilitation of a structure or remodeling a little bit when you move in that somebody's taking good care of it, it does cost less than building a new building, obviously, and you have a great location. Um, you're reusing city infrastructure, which sometimes really needs to be upgraded, and that's when you talk to DOLA or you know, uh, Main Street's parent, agent, parent agency, and uh, we talk about some of those grants that we offer through the Energy and Mineral Impact Fund. Then also energy savings. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later on. But first off, let's just talk about authenticity. So authenticity is a topic that can affect us in a lot of different ways. Um, you know it when you see it. Uh, that's the best way I can describe how you know if something's authentic or not. For example, 
you know, you've been in places, you know, even over in Stapleton or, or a, a city park area over there where there's been, uh, you know, Main Street-esque designs or even go to Disney World and Main Street USA is there. Everything's like a two-thirds scale proportion or three-fifths scale. They're just, it's not accurate. It's not intended to be accurate necessarily, but it's, it's essentially mimicking something um, often in a poor way, like these buildings on the right, maybe they're even interconnected inside, but they're given different facades so that it mirrors the typical way the building block of Main Street was constructed. So it's not authentic. It's, it's something that's, that's false. And then also, like, you can look at details of materials. You know, you know historic brick when you see it. And then there are materials. I have no idea why this material even exists on the right. I've never seen it except for this photo is taken in a little town in Oklahoma. It, it's just something that's mimicking brick, but it's not real brick. Again, you know, brick streets were made so that you could actually pull the bricks up periodically um, and, and repave to get you know, bumps out of the road or work on the pipes underneath the ground. You know, when you do stamped concrete, you have to get underneath there and work on some, uh, some infrastructure, some pipes or something. You're gonna have a big patch in your concrete and it's never gonna look the same. So why even do that? Why just not keep modern things modern? These are great examples, um, again, from some small town images that I've taken on the right. Um, uh, the one on the left, I took in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, you know, this great uh, old community where back in the day, they only had small pieces of glass. Glass was quite rare. So you didn't see large plate glass windows uh, in buildings of this age. And we don't have buildings of this age in, in Colorado anyway. But, you know, someone on the right took, and you can see what the buildings on either side of it are. So you kind of can think, well, it wasn't stucco to begin with. It probably was this, you know, nice looking, simple brick material. And they've stuccoed it over. They've had, you know, they've covered the second floor windows because they're probably just using it for storage. If it's even a second floor, that's the funny thing. Maybe it's just plastered on. It's not real, but they're mimicking a style that doesn't even exist in their town. Similarly here. You know, you have these wonderful buildings that have, a, you know, in this case, the materiality of a wood siding um, and, you know, expressing that over an older building where it doesn't belong, it's false. And I don't think we should do this in our towns. This is an inappropriate use of materials. You know, and here we are with Disney again. I'm not saying Disney's wrong. I, mean, I think it's cool that they have so much nostalgia around the things they build in the parks, but it's just funny when you have this wonderful old historic stadium and, you know, it's now an entry gate to Disney theme park. So really the question is, who do you think you are? Who is your town? Do you want to celebrate the history of the place or does it need to be some new fashion design? And I think most people will agree that there's a lot of beauty in the simple and the refined. Another topic is uh, policy and regulation. You know, downtown uh, public policy is uh, very important to build a good preservation program and to have a, have a good Main Street district. Um, make sure that your public policies are preservation friendly. And we're gonna talk about volunteering a way at the end here, but you know, having a group that's dedicated to the design point in your Main Street uh, uh, community, on your Main Street board, maybe a separate uh, committee uh, that would be willing to like, you know, make friends with folks at the city and talk to them about you know strategic planning and things like that whenever comprehensive planning comes up or things like that let's get us let's get a, a preservation plan in place at least at the city level if we haven't had one done by you know certified local government grant let's talk about it locally and what the place means and how we're going to steward it um, you know it's a good time also to put in things like uh, some sustainability uh, uh, language which ties very closely to historic preservation. It's all about conserving resources when we boil everything down in the realm of sustainability. On the left, you're gonna see a book. Um, this was uh, published in part by uh, uh, History Colorado, the Main Street Program, uh, and DOLA, which helped fund this, this, this document. Again, I believe if you click on it in the PDF, it will pop it up online so you could at least read it. Um, it's essentially a, a, a quick, very quick read on how certified local governments work in Colorado. Um, certified local governments program is a wonderful complementary program that goes with Main Streets quite well. Um, it's essentially how you develop a preservation ethic in your community. It's about setting up a, uh, uh, an ordinance, 
having a, a board that maybe would review or very limited amounts of review or, or oversight, um, uh, preservation projects, and essentially develop things like guidelines for your downtown and how, you know, taking it to that next notch to where we know it's important, why is it important, and then how are we going to take care of it? Those are the kinds of things you can do with CLG. Um, but beyond that, so like, you know, you have your comprehensive plan, you have a preservation ordinance, get design guidelines potentially that tie to your ordinance um, so that you can get certificates of appropriateness before you get a building permit for buildings that are very important. Um, then pl preservation planning, we, we, uh, uh, we, we've seen that. Um, uh, it's, beyond, it's a step beyond a survey typically, but it, it could include a survey like La Junta's that we saw earlier. That's a great building. You know, that's the building block to have a good historic preservation plan. You can do one without a survey, like I was saying at more of a local level, but it's not gonna be 100% accurate in terms of knowing what you have at the beginning. Um, also things like a minimum maintenance ordinance is very important, especially when you have a lot of absentee owners that don't take care of their properties, uh, people like that. Uh, they don't have the resources a lot of times to take care of their properties and it really needs to be passed on to someone who's ready to go and put a business in there um, you know so you know broken glass and things like that the city can even set that up where they can abate that concern you know with a public notification and posting on the property um, and uh, you know charge that back to um, uh, with uh, property taxes there's you know, that gets really squirrely though. I know in Colorado, we don't want folks telling us what to do with our properties, but sometimes it is necessary. You know, when, it, when you have a thriving main street and kind of a, a dud of a building that could be great, but no one's doing anything with it. It's, the question is why, and what do we need to do to motivate those folks? There are holdouts. They think their building's gonna be worth a million dollars in five years. That's not the case. Often, you know, they're not worth as much as people think because they need lots of work when those buildings have suffered from so much minimum maintenance. Kind of a complicated looking thing over on the left, but just focus on the middle one where it says guidelines. Um, you know, uh, design guidelines are recommended for all owners in a district. I think that's important, um, especially when you have a good uh, 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 pe preservation ordinance and commission or a board uh, for preservation. You should base your design guidelines on the Secretary of the Interior Standards, uh, at least for, or you could just say the Secretary of the Interior Standards. And on the graph to the left, you're gonna see guidelines and it says SOI, and that's Secretary of the Interior Standards. And so a simple version of that might just say, hey, you know, our Preservation Commission Board is actually going to review your, your plans for what you wanna to do to the facade of the Main Street building or the interior maybe even, if it's significant enough, and we're gonna review it against the standards. And if we interpret the standards in such a way that you, we think you are failing in some regards to meeting the standards, then we would request that you go back to the drawing board or maybe there would be um, some contingency plan. Like we will approve it if you'll use authentic wood windows instead of vinyl, something like that can be done. Um, you know, an improved or a little more stringent uh, goes to Secretary of the Interior Plus, which may include you know, separate provisions that are specific to your town's needs. And then the strongest is really a custom design guideline. That would be where you uh, work hand in hand with a preservation consultant that maybe specializes in design guidelines. Uh, again, you can work with uh, uh, Lindsay at the CLG program, others at History Colorado that have knowledge. Um, you can uh, apply for grants to um, take care of this often for no, mo no money if, you go, if you're a CLG program. Um, it's a good opportunity also to have these in place because if they are custom, you're really telling the story of your town through the guidelines. You know, again, you start off with like, these are good examples of this style of architecture. These are the details of this style that we think are character defining to the, to the properties. Um, we want to keep this, obviously. You start to tell a story about the original construction of these buildings and places you know, and objects, sculptures or, or whatever um, can be significant. Um, and then you, your town knows about it better. And once they know why they're preserving things and they're not putting vinyl windows in every, in every upper floor window, then it makes more sense to them. You can talk about the value improvement. You can talk about all the uh, public benefit. You know, it's history you can touch literally 
we don't have that a lot in our society, but that is literally what Main Street can do is that you can put yourself back in time by just walking up to one of these old buildings. I mean, hugging a tree is one thing, but you know, trying to hug a building is maybe a different one. I think it's important for design guidelines though to make them mandatory. You know, even if you don't have a historic preservation commission, that whatever these basic guidelines you may set up um, for development in the downtown district, you know, by ordinance, um, essentially if you have a facade grant that's gonna be like a 50% match up to 5,000 or 10, or however you would word that, um, so that you would incentivize people taking better care of their, their facades, or roofs or however, whatever you want to incentivize, um, you would want to make your guidelines mandatory to get that money. So a plan, you know, I mentioned it may be a step beyond a survey and maybe not. Maybe you could just do a plan. You know, is it the best situation? No, I think you should probably survey your properties first. That's why there are not many preservation plans that have been done in the state. This one's from Lafayette. Um, I actually reached out and got this example. Um, it's great. I just looked through the table of contents and it was broken down into these goals, vision and process, historical context, identification of historic areas, education and outreach, goals and policies, and a five-year action plan. Okay, let's move into buildings. Again, I'm so sorry this is condensed. I wish we could just make design as a full point of Main Street. You know, wish we had time to really talk about each one of these things in detail because I know buildings is where a lot of folks' hearts are. Um, they are the thing that have character in your downtown that gives it the sense of place more than anything. But we just can't really drill down in any, any one of these aspects particularly because I want to take you through the whole design point today. Now, if you want these presentations um, embellished, any of these six topics that we're talking about today, we can present on that in your community, in person, virtually, however it works the best. And we can break these up into specific points. We could talk on two of the three of the points that are most important to you. And we would just tailor that to fit your community and the needs that you need. So just reach out to me um, if you are interested in more information about some of these topics. So the Secretary of the Interior Standard. Um, it's not just one. I mean, the one we focus on the most is rehabilitation. And that's essentially where you can take a property um, and give it a new use, even some adaptive construction, particularly on the inside to make the building fit for use today. Like if a building didn't have a commercial kitchen, for example, and it's gonna be a great spot for a restaurant, it works out well, there's a way to do the grease pit and all the things that you need for a restaurant, the venting for the hoods, you know, all of that can work out well without disrupting anything that's character defining of the building itself, um, you know, that's rehabilitation. We're not keeping it at this, as the exact same use. Um, the four treatments are, the four different uh, standards, I would say, are, you know, preservation, which is essentially keeping things how they are. You know, sometimes that means mothballing a building until we have money to rehabilitate a building or to restore a building. But it's essentially keeping things well taken care of and protecting it as a resource. Uh, rehabilitation is just what I mentioned. It's very flexible. You have to practice good rehabilitation. And I mean, they're, this is where they look at the standards very closely because they're tied to um, being able to, to uh, access the uh, federal and state historic preservation tax credits. And you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but Colorado is like the second best in the country in terms of percentage of state historic tax credit you can achieve. Those tax credits are 35% of all your qualifying expenses, which is essentially everything tied to the building, all the system, mechanical systems, brick repointing, new windows, a new roof, you know, uh, you know, taking care of historic tile flooring and making that restored, you know, whatever the whatever is tied to now. If you took a building and you turned it upside down and you shook it real hard, all the stuff that would fall out, like appliances, carpeting, things like that those would not be qualified expenditures typically. Um, so you want, to, you want to practice good rehabilitation in any case, because you want to go after, um, you have to have your building designated to get the tax credits. I will say that as well. If it's for the state, you have to be at least designated at a local level, which is important to note in Colorado. You don't necessarily have to be listed at the state level to get the 35% tax credit, but you do have to have a legit uh, commission 
Uh, typically, a CLG program would be the for sure. Um, but you know, as long as you have a good uh, designation process in your community that's by ordinance written into your code, then you can actually claim historic tax credits at the state level if your building is locally designated. Now, for the federal tax credit, you actually have to have the building listed on the National Register. So it's a little harder to achieve. Not every just plain Jane Main Street building, which are all wonderful buildings and have wonderful uses, um, not all those may qualify. They may not be significant enough. They may be missing in enough original features to make them not have enough integrity to qualify for, uh, you know, all the uh, to qualify for even a rehabilitation. There just it might not be enough left. It might be damaged too much. There's certain things that uh, you have to pass and you have to have enough integrity to uh, qualify to be designated uh, um, historic, especially at the national level. Um, absolutely, you referenced the Secretary of the Interior Standards and local policy, like we talked about. Um, and, uh, and I didn't mention also restoration is essentially taking a building back to a, pre uh, back to a previous use that was a more significant time in its history. Um, a good example is uh, in Trinidad, the uh, Fox West Theater, which is kind of an entry point to downtown Trinidad. You've probably seen it if you've been there. Um, recently, the, the, the facade the, the, it had been uh, remodeled. There was a marquee that was established in, in the 30s, mid to late 30s. Um, that was all actually taken off um, and it's been saved and it's, it's an artifact now and it's gonna be displayed publicly, okay? But the facade was important because it was a, a master builder that essentially designed this original theater facade of the Rapp Brothers, which have built several buildings and quite a few, uh, uh, quite a few theaters across the country. Uh, so this was a significant resource and it needed to be restored back to a present, uh, a previous uh, condition. Uh, and it was, uh, there was enough remaining uh, uh, forensic details that you could see how it was originally constructed. So it was possible to restore it. Um, and then finally, uh, reconstruction would be like, oh, this uh, historic mansion had a, you know, had a great uh, a carriage house, and we only have a few pictures of it, but it's enough that we think we can represent it well enough that it would tell the story. Although we wouldn't make it look old, we would say, you know, you can tell this is newer. It's got a little bit better, you know, smoother materials and things like that. We can call it a reconstruction, and then you could potentially uh, go after some tax credit money on that one. That might be a hard one to go for. I've worked on a project like that. Biggest issues with buildings. This is what you see everywhere. You know, you see deferred maintenance. Again, we went through this period of disinvestment in Main Street districts across the country, and we uh, essentially need to catch that up. This has gone through a few different property owners. Uh, it's been passed down to folks that maybe weren't sure they wanted to do it, no, didn't know what to do with granddad's old shop or, you know, uh, you know, gosh, I don't know. We'll just hold on to it, or maybe we'll sell it. And we're, you know, does it need a new roof? We don't know because we don't use it. Um, inappropriate materials. We touched on that a little bit. You can see that in these photos here. Um, it's a it's a problem. I think though that most people want to do the best they can do. I mean, I don't know if that sounds right, but they, I think people that own these buildings, it's their baby. It's the thing that they, they own it. They want to take care of it. It's like your home, you know, it's like something that's, it's maybe it's their nest egg. And, you know, for the bottom left photo here, which was, you know, which is currently a bar, was a bar before it became uh, vacant. Um, you know, they covered the, upper, the, the transom windows across the top, those gray windows, the band that runs across above the doorways. Um, Maybe because they didn't want a lot of light in the bar. And so they didn't really celebrate the, the originality of having glass windows that brought light in there before we maybe had electric light. You know, so, um, but they still wanted to do the best. They said, you know, we can only afford this. And so that's all folks can do sometimes. So you have to take some of these things with a grain of salt. You have to say, okay, they, they tried. You know, they could only afford vinyl windows and they were going to frame them in on the second floor, like the one on the right, which I have no idea why they didn't use the same window. They probably just had them in their barn or something. Um, but they also bricked in the, the storefront, which I think is terrible on a building. Um, 
all that to say, sometimes you can tell there was good intention. Sometimes it's like we didn't know, which is an education issue. And you can help people locally by informing them about good design and preservation and why we want to sort of keep things the way that they were. Why is that important to telling the story of our past? The thing that there really is no excuse for is folks that don't take care of their buildings and don't really care. And folks that want to charge rent to folks that have leaky roofs and stuff like that. Uh, there was a, in McAllister, Oklahoma, I remember there was a, a business that had moved across the street to a different building, um, you know, change, you know, different, different owner, different everything, because the roof leaked less. And I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, I can't believe folks would do this and, and treat their tenants this way. But it, it's, it's a pervasive problem in most towns. And so it's something to look out for. And it's sort of a reason why you might want to take a bulldog or some, uh, have a, a bulldog approach or have some kind of an ordinance, like a maintenance ordinance or something like that uh, with a little bit of bite. But you got to have somebody at the town that's going to enforce it, um, you know, for things like this. You know, it's all about public health, safety and welfare. It's not necessarily always the most important thing to let people do what they want to do. At least that's just my two cents. Architectural style. Now I know, you know, across the whole state, we have a range of styles. The interesting thing though, is that I would say most properties, well, most properties were developed originally in the Victorian era, which you guys may not, I didn't act, this is funny, but I actually didn't know this when I was looking at this the other day. Uh, there is no Victorian building. You can say a building has a Victorian style, but that's not really specific. Victorian era was when Queen Victoria ruled in England. Um, and that's that's what a Victorian building is, is, you know, they're, they're often very ornate, ornate. They have, uh, you know, uh, angled roofs a lot of times or an angled uh, uh, pediment like on this building or um, or cornice rather. Um, they have they have certain details, but these are borrowed from these styles on the right. These are some of the styles I probably missed some, but some of the styles that you'll see maybe a little hint of this and maybe a little bit of that. It, you know, it depends on the designer, but they were drawing from influences of the time. And a lot of these influences came from Europe where most folks had come from that had settled in the United States. Or I would say, uh, you know, uh, most folks. Um, these do extend through different time periods though. And I tried to list them. They're not really in order, but uh, you know, some period, some like Art Deco de definitely happened in the 20th century. So they are sort of tied to style. I have an extensive document uh, from that uh, uh, urban regional planning student that did the timeline that actually has examples of all of the different styles and with some examples of buildings. I'm glad to share that with anyone that would like to see it. Okay, just a typical Main Street building just how it's made up. Now, this could be a one-story building if you're looking over to the right or in the middle, and it could just be cut off at that cornice where there's a built-in sign panel, where a lot of times folks would hang a wood sign, you know, and they may not be able to light it, but that's a prominent location. It kind of sets the standard for like, here's where all the business signage would be. Now, a lot of times it would hang off the building to get people's attention, just like we should use that today to get people in an automobile or on foot to be able to see from down the street, you know, there's a, uh, a shoe cobbler there, or, you know, this is an outdoor store or, or things like that. Um, you know, it was neat that it was built into the building as one of the actual details. Um, you'll see a typical Main Street storefront below that's represented by the model on the right. Um, the model on the right, actually, instead of having just open transom glazing, that those the windows that band across the top of the storefront doors, um, these were prismatic, uh, glazing, which are little, uh, I don't know, I think they're probably about four inch square tiles. They could, sometimes they're bigger, but they often uh, diffract light, which is pretty neat. If you've been in a building that has these, um, when light directly hits them, it just scatters it on the interior and it takes light way back into the space. So, you know, those, those are a fun detail when you have those on your building. But in either case, transom windows were made to bring light deep into the building. Um, also upper floor windows here, you're gonna see, they were made to be double hung windows almost always so that you could um, either lower the top sash or raise the bottom or both in order to um, get cross ventilation or some level of ventilation in the room that you were in. 
Um, and at the top often we had decorative cornices uh, and window hoods that would be over windows. Now that's, this is a really nice looking example on the right of what you could have, but you could have inherited this. You could have a building where they haven't used the upper floor dentist's office that was built in as like part, you know, um, for years and the, the person that occupied downstairs they decided they were going to use it for storage and it's like well some kids busted the glass or something happened there hailstorm i'm just going to board those over because i don't really need to see out anymore up here you know and then oh we got to put an air conditioner right in the transom where it's going to leak on you going into the to the business i've seen this so many times it's hilarious um because and the funny thing is that we're going to take away the transom glass that's very unique and irreplaceable and we're going to do that a lot of times transoms get broken also, honestly as well. And that's why they get covered up with wood paneling or something in a truck or something like in the middle there where we've decided we're gonna go with cedar shakes on the front of our downtown commercial building. We think that's a really good way to make things look good and old. You know, this is like historic looking. It's great. This is like the biggest killer on Main Street. I call him Charlie Mansard, which I don't know if you get the, con the context of that, but that type of a roof, a mansard roof, um, has that angle to it typically. Um, you know, maybe we we're gonna cover the upper floor windows again. And then on the right, you know, good intentions again, but most lawyers, and I'm not singling out lawyers by any means, but you know, it could be certain types of businesses, you know what I'm talking about, that build these kinds of more, I'm gonna do it my way, and my way looks like this. And I'm not going to pay any attention to what was there. I don't need big glass windows in the front. As a matter of fact, my clientele is private, so I'm going to shut all that off. Well, I mean, folks, you need to listen and think about, are there things like blinds? Can you do those? I mean, nowadays we have vinyl wraps you can put on the inside of windows that you can see out, but you can't see in. There's so many cool creative solutions to keep the original architecture intact. You don't need to do this. You're not creating a false history, but you're making history here. You're actually setting a new precedent for this building that it's better, in my opinion, they're trying to say, this is better than what it was. And in that case, we have to go with it as people that are historians, um, because we think, you know, well, they updated that in the 80s and another 10 years, it'll be historic if they've done it well. Often enough, though, they're not done well. When you need to know what a building looks like, there are lots of resources. Um, looking off old photos is the best and most common way to look, to look back and see what a specific building looked at a specific point in time. But there are these really neat old books that you can find. And I'm sorry I didn't put the resource title down here, but it's the um, um, APT or American Preser uh, Preservation uh, Institute. It's there online, open to the public, digital library. And there are many catalogs of particular window manufacturers, like the aluminum windows that you see around a lot of the, that are historic at this point on storefronts, um, different kinds of hardware for doors that may be back to the turn of the century or something. I mean, they have these really great catalogs of products and things. Some of them are actually plans that you could actually, that you could make your, you know, this is a building you could buy the plans and you could build this and here's how much it would cost. I just thought this was a fascinating book. So I wanted to share that with you. So what happens if a building's been lost? I'll bet every one of our Main Street, all of you guys have seen Main Street districts that have a missing tooth along the block. And it was probably a loss from fire typically. Um, it could be other things. Um, it could be somebody just lost a building because it was uh, demolition by neglect concern by the town. You know, that would be the worst case scenario. Um, but buildings can often, you know, everything's collapsed in from snow loads and they just said, you know, it's not worth saving anymore. It's just literally not worth the money to save the building. So they may remove it. Unfortunate when that happens. But what do you do when you need to build back? Well, um, this is a neat acronym from an architect in Georgia. Uh, that they follow with their Main Street program. And it's fresh. When you're looking to develop a new property, a uh, new building, you know, that's sandwiched between others, for example, or on a corner or wherever downtown, it could be anywhere. Does it fit these things? The footprint and the foundation, are they similar? Does it fall into that 25, 50 foot, 75 foot type of a situation? Or are we going to only build back, you know, if there's a 50 foot lot, are we only going to build back 40 feet? Why in the heck would you do that? Maybe there's a reason. 
but it's something to think about. It's out of the norm. Uh, roof shape, you know, you don't put gabled roofs downtown. I mean, it'd be a huge roof structure, right? But um, you wouldn't do that on a downtown area. It just doesn't really fit in a whole block of flat roof buildings. You know, the envelope, you know, how the mass of the building is the way I think about it. Visually, what mass does the building take on? You know, are you complementing buildings adjacent? Are you fitting in? Does it have a similar function and form? I mean, that you know, the size of the rooms inside, things like that make up the overall feel of the building. You know, does the building have a similar cladding? This is where I might depart a little bit and say that in some contexts, especially in more urban contexts, like not necessarily smaller towns, but it could be in the right place, you could use modern materials like a metal cladding or some, a glass. I mean, large glass uh, pieces, um, window walls, things like that in the right place in a historic area differentiates the building enough that you know it's not historic, which is what you want to do with any infill building anyway. You're going to use modern brick and, and things like that. It'll be obvious that it's not a historic building if you're doing it well, but it will also fit into all of these things. You know, there would be like a, you know, there'd be a design, uh, a way of designing so the windows and the rhythm of the doors and windows, like the upper floor windows would all have this like repetitive nature across the facade and they would probably be at about the same floor to floor height as the buildings next to it so that it provides kind of a continuity of the space how it was originally you can make it function very much the same it'd just be so out of whack if we had this you know this grand victorian block that had these wonderful tall second floor windows and then you have your building that you built the first floor only about 10 feet to the ceiling instead of you know 15 20 feet sometimes to the second floor and then your windows, your second floor windows are way down here. It just would not be a good looking building. So those are things to think about when you're uh, advising, talking to people about what they ought to put in a new place. All right, so for public private reinvestment, not as much to discuss here, but I wanna lead you through some things. This is not even close, the resources and incentives that there are for preservation in Colorado. We've developed a pretty comprehensive uh, uh, sheet that we're glad to share, uh, Tracy and I, um, that have, uh, and sort of our new thing, you're gonna talk about this in a little while, but there's an approach that we're developing called the heritage energy approach. So we're essentially trying to tie responsible energy retrofitting into the historic building in a way that it does not disrupt character defining features of the building, but it makes it a little bit more modern so that you can have, I mean, these originally didn't have air conditioning, right? But we do now, so are we doing it right? Probably not. So how can we do that more uh, efficiently, healthy, more healthy, uh, better air quality, things like that? That's when you go after energy grants. Um, I, I put a couple uh, photos up here. Um, the Colorado Clean Energy Fund is, an, is a, is a, a, a a loan, it's a not-for-profit green bank, you can get loans to do responsible, energy-efficient-ish kind of work. And I say ish because like brickery pointing, they'll pay for that, right? And you can borrow the money. It's a 15-year note. There's only a 2% origination fee on the loan. That's it. Um, you, uh, um, the, it's, com oh, sorry, it's competitive rates. I gotta get back where I was. It's competitive rates. Sorry about all that. Where did I go? Um, man, I went the wrong way, guys. Sorry. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, you could pair that money and make it your uh, match for, say, a state historical fund grant. Then you're going to get the tax credits, right? And ideally, you have a designated building. That's kind of the, the approach we're going to talk about again in a minute. But it, you use these things together to essentially maximize what your historic tax credit payout is, which you can use state historical fund money. I don't know if you know this, but anything that anything you put into the building, including grant money, counts for the tax credits. So you can actually, it's like double dipping, but it's what, the way it's set up to do. Um, developers take advantage of this all the time. So I would love smaller property owners to do this as well. What I was gonna say about the Clean Energy Fund is that we've worked with them and they've worked with us and they've uh, said, you know, since the minimum reinvestment that's now required in order to, to claim a uh, historic preservation tax credit for the state of Colorado is only $20,000, 
to, in order to get a tax credit, you only have to spend $20,000. Um, and it has to be, you know, a, a designated building locally or at the state level or federally. Um, they said, hey, you know, we'll let you borrow down to $20,000. So that's pretty fantastic, especially if you're doing some things to the building, like putting solar on the roof or some things like that that are going to pay back very quickly. You know, inter efficient lighting, a better HVAC system, things like that. It'll pay back very quickly. Um, so they're a good resource. I would, I would look at them as an opportunity. There are also low interest loans from the Colorado Historical Foundation, which are also worth a look at when you're looking for funding for these projects for match money or for just, you know, bridge funding to get to the part where you get the tax credit, then you uh, uh, pay down your loans. And again, uh, one other quick uh, advantage to the Clean Energy Fund is they'll let you pay down your loan with a big sum from a tax credit, state tax credit that you sell to another party, you get the money, like 90 cents on the dollar, they'll allow you to pay down your loan, you know, the principal, and they will allow you to reschedule your loan one time with very, very minimal fees involved. You don't have to refinance and all that, in other words. I know I'm running short on time here. These are kind of the things that I can do. I mean, we've talked a lot through these slides about um, the types of things design encompasses, but I like to work one-on-one -on -one with property owners and assist them directly with their properties, kind of meet them where they are um, and help them move forward with their dream, their desire for the building or business plan. Great example project here. I want to share on it. We had a, a wonderful grant program that provided some pretty good money to a lot of Main Street towns called the Main Street Open for Business program. This was a, a very beginning building that we had brought in under a special pilot project. Um, this is the Herald Democrat building in Leadville. You see it as soon as you round the corner by town hall. There it is. It was this uh, mint green for years and years. Um, the business owner had no idea how to go about preservation at all. So he, I, I had contacted him. I was there with the Main Street manager one day and saw the building. They said, oh, I can put you in contact with the owner. And I was like, hey, you know, maybe we want to look at maybe doing some stuff. That's a cool building. Like, oh, what can we do? Well, then we ended up with this grant money. And I said, look, you can get the grant money. You can also get, go after the historic tax credits because this building was already listed on the National Register. So through a series of minor miracles, because we only had 10 months to complete the project to finish the grant and for him to get the money to be able to do it, we found a contractor in town, an excellent preservation architect in town, and we walked through this project and saw it completely restored to its original design, we think even colors, in a matter of 10 months. And this is one of the most dramatic transformations I've ever seen uh, for a commercial building downtown. Cool story is they had to flip. They had to take each brick. They took several sections of brick out at a time, and they would because uh, they couldn't remove the paint without damaging the patina on the brick. Um, so uh, they flipped each brick 180 degrees and reset it, so it's fresh, just like it would have looked. Here's another quick example of a project where we literally took a photo, did a quick uh, pen and an ink color over it. Uh, this is in Hugo, Colorado, and it was funded by the same grant program. The, the person that owned this building um, decided that they liked the sketch and so went forward and it turned out really well. The signage, this was a building that got hit by a car. So that's why it's such an odd modern type addition. And here's one I'm working on now with, with uh, a potential uh, uh, a person that is looking at the Manhattan Bar building in, in Leadville. It's one of the holdout corner buildings that just needs so much work. So we looked at an old photo, which you see in the middle there, and that's what kind of had to go off of. And we started doing a concept. This is a quick concept. So celebrate everything that happens downtown. Even small improvements make a big difference. They often catalyze more and more people to spend money and update their buildings. You want to work closely with the town. You want to... Uh, uh, work with them on grant opportunities like the Main Street Open for Business grant. You want to work with individual businesses. You want to actually help the town develop uh, initiatives like facade grant programs. You know, offering education and training like a, a walking tour, a design workshop, things like that, that, that myself or folks at History Colorado could come and support 
We're all glad to do that. We'd love to get out in the communities and work with you guys. Uh, the, again, the grant funding from the CLG program could help you develop a walking tour. It can help you do all kinds of stuff. Such a wonderful program. And then when we're working together, uh, you know, make sure you get in there at the beginning. You have that group of committed people that wants to see the planning for the town and preservation be a component of the planning for the town. Make sure that everyone's involved. Get everybody's input because everybody's input matters. Volunteer. Get out there on a Saturday, you know, bring your tools. Convince a, a property owner that, hey, your building would look one heck of a lot better if we removed that mansard awning that was built on with the tacky cedar shingles. And then follow through. In this case, the city like loaned some uh, tools, ladders, and a roll-off dumpster. And then the, all Main Street volunteers, they formed a facade squad is what they call it. There's been, there's some of those in Colorado, Oklahoma as well, other states maybe. Um, then lastly, I just want to zip you through the idea that the greenest building is the one that's already built. So existing buildings, we touched on this a little bit, like why preservation is important. Um, but I want you to keep in mind that it's not only about why the buildings are important, but just that we're passing these on to the next generation. There are a lot of sustainable attributes to the building that are built in. This is the approach I was talking about. We're essentially combining energy funding with preservation funding and the new um, technical support that we're offering to get buildings up to date, energy efficient, and looking better than ever. And then finally, this is my favorite quote when we're talking about buildings in Main Street. Therefore, let us build, when we build, let us think that we build forever. Let us not be for present delight nor for present use alone. Let it be for such work as our descendants will thank us for. And let us think as we lay stone on stone that a time is to come when those stones will be held sacred because our hands have touched them and that men will say as they look upon the labor and wrought substance of them, see this our fathers did for us. And that's it. And I'm sorry I went over, um, but if there's any questions, I'll hang around as long as you guys want. My contact information is at the bottom of the page there. Um, but as, like I said, it's a condensed version and I'm glad to come to your town or do virtual presentations on any of these topics in particular to do this presentation again. Um, we're here to serve you guys. So let us know. And if you have any questions, you can do the chat or uh, Tracy can do it or, um, or you can just unmute and, and ask them. I'm looking through here. Um, I think I uh, we do maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, CPI's revitalization revitalization grant. Um, uh, Gail dropped that into chat. Yeah, that's true. I don't know when that cycle closes. I think it's pretty soon. June tenth, um, I believe. Okay, June tenth. Yeah, um, it's it's June tenth. Yes. Okay. And it's very similar to the Main Street Open for Business funding is is what they're looking for, except the buildings do need to be designated as historic. Okay. And that's possible. Like I said, a local designation. And I don't know about that program, honestly. I don't know if it has to be state designated or federally designated. It might It might need to be national because the money comes from the National Trust and the National Park Service, I think. That, okay, that makes you sense. Are, you are correct, Tracy. Yeah, sorry we went over, guys. I was paying attention at the time, and then those last two sections got me. But um, thanks for coming. Um, appreciate everybody being here and just let us know how we can help. Indeed. Thanks. Hope to see you all next week. All right.